So if I can begin by going, saying two things. First, I'd like to thank the university and the business school for including me in their activities in this adjunct role. I'm enjoying it. It's been a difficult year, obviously, but I, I just look forward to continuing that for a little while longer. But going back in time, in the 1960s, as a high school student, I attended Hollywood Senior High School. Now you will know that as uh, Shenton College. Um, Hollywood was a good school, had high academic standards, uh, and it was selected to be the first school in Western Australia to engage in Asian studies in history. And our school studied modern China. So we went back in history through Sun Yat-sen, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Ma Zedong, the Long March, and finally uh, in 1949, the establishment of the People's Republic of China under the Communist Party. So that was an extraordinary and interesting time. It seemed to me to be far more interesting and relevant than the 19th century uh, continental European history. I could never ever have envisaged in those high school days that one day I would be in the Great Hall in a private dining room, sitting next to President Xi Jinping, talking about China, Australia, uh, along with about 10 other people. Um, such is life, I guess, the way it works out. Uh, as I said, I'm no China expert and I don't pretend to be, but I do think I've had a, a unique experience in the relationship. Uh, obviously, China and Australia are very complementary economies. Uh, China with its massive population, uh, its industrialization, its need for natural resources and the like. Uh, Australia, uh, small population, huge country, very rich in diverse natural resources. So it's a bit of a marriage made in heaven, I guess, in that economic sense. But I think we need to always uh, remember that there are just such significant differences. Uh, differences in history, uh, difference uh, in socially, uh, ethnic differences, uh, political difference, quite obvious. And sometimes I don't think we as Australians are as conscious of that as we should be. The start of the relationship between Australia and China clearly was political. Uh, 1972, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam uh, was party to um, the establishment of diplomatic relations. That was a big event, but perhaps not a great deal happened for quite a while. I think the next big event was in Western Australia. That was the uh, development of the Chana iron ore mine in the Pilbara region. This was the first overseas investment undertaken by China. Uh, it was a joint venture between the Ministry of Metallurgical Industries, uh, Beijing, now called a state-owned enterprise, uh, and Hammersley Iron, now Rio Tinto. It was opened with great fanfare by Chinese uh, Vice President Li Peng and uh, Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke. Uh, and that really started two things. It started Australia's economic engagement with China, and it started China's first international investment. Uh, this was the start of the socialist market economy reforms of Chinese President Li Peng. And Western Australia was right there in the center of it. Uh, something that we should be proud of, and something I know the Chinese government, even of today, is very proud of that, that first step. Um, when I went into politics, and that was uh, in 1990, uh, I went in with uh, a couple of motivations. I must say, I'm not a particularly political animal. Uh, I don't get caught up in all the grand political debates and philosophical issues. My interest was very much uh, economic development, the resources industry, Asia, and also regional development. They were the things that uh, drove me uh, or attracted me, I guess, into politics and particularly state politics, because that's where most of that still to this day actually happens. Um, so I uh, became a member of parliament in 1990. I was lucky, you need to be lucky in politics, and I was. Uh, 18 months later, uh, I was deputy leader of the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party was in opposition, so I was deputy opposition leader. Another nine months after that, uh, Richard Court led the Liberal Party to election victory. Uh, I was his deputy. Therefore, I had the choice of any portfolio I wanted. I chose to take on the role of resources development and energy. And a little bit later, I took on the role also of education minister. But my dream had come true in that sense in just a very, very short period of time, uh, less than three years. So there I was with the opportunity to do things. 
I also had in my mind uh, a sense of history. Uh, I was very conscious of the development of Western Australia and particularly the 1890s gold rush um, when population of this state went from 50 to 200,000, it doesn't sound much today. Um, the Premier of the time, John Forrest, a great leader, uh, went through all sorts of uh, uh, catastrophic issues and controversies uh, in developing the state during that time. Uh, obviously the water pipeline to Kalgoorlie stands out. Uh, then nothing much happened. Then in the 1960s, uh, Western Australia had its great second surge of development, built around the post-war reconstruction of Japan uh, and the development of the Pilbara iron ore deposits and then the Pilbara uh, gas resources. Uh, that was an extraordinary period of time. I remember it well. Um, it was only 15 years after the end of the Second World War. Uh, my father had been one of the rats of Tobruk. He had fought against the Japanese in New Guinea. Uh, my uncle, to whom I was very close, had been a prisoner of war on the uh, Burma rail line. For that generation to see our future tied to Japan was not only a significant economic change, but it was an extraordinary political achievement of the time. And my uncle and my father went along with it, albeit reluctantly, but they could see that was a big part of Western Australia's future. So I had that sort of sense of the story of the development of Western Australia and our connection uh, to Asia. Um, my first visit to China uh, was in 1994, 26 years ago. Um, and uh, I didn't know much about China, obviously never been there, hadn't really read a great deal about it. I arrived at a time when our relationship and trade was only really just starting to grow. Um, Australia's total exports to China at that time was just $2 billion. $900 million, nearly half of it was from Western Australia, principally around iron ore and agriculture. I found China at that stage to be quite fascinating, but really, to be honest, quite drab. Um, uh, workers were still largely in tunics and overall outfits of various descriptions. The buildings looked old and dusty and uh, nothing flash, nothing exciting really to see. In Shanghai, I was taken out to see the Pudong, which was simply a cow paddock. Uh, nothing there at all, but they told me there were great plans. I was a little bit sceptical, but I was wrong. Um, so that was um, my first experience. Uh, when I came back, I uh, invited all of Western Australia's leading business identities uh, in mining, uh, manufacturing, trade, agriculture, into my office for a glass of wine. And I proceeded to give a talk on my impressions of China. Uh, what was extraordinary about that is that virtually none of our business leaders had ever visited China, like myself, and had no real understanding of China. I made the comment at the end of that address that I believe that China would be as important to us in the coming years as Japan had been in the 1960s and 70s. And of course, um, that came to pass. So they were the early days. Um, as I say, the major export, iron ore, 17 million tonnes. Today, it's over 600 million tonnes. There's been a quick growth in the relationship. But if you look at it another way, our relationship with China is still very young, 25, 30 years in an economic sense, um, potentially a long way to go. So that was uh, that period. The other thing that happened during the 1990s that is significant is that uh, Chinese Vice President Zhu Rongji visited Western Australia. He came to look at the iron ore industry and uh, I accompanied him on the one day trip to look at the mines, look at the rail lines, uh, and to look at the iron ore ports. And he was very impressed, and uh, as he should be. Uh, it was impressive. During the course of the day, I talked to him about natural gas. And I said, Western Australia also has large gas reserves. Um, China has energy issues. Um, we could look at maybe a trade relationship and exporting uh, gas as liquefied natural gas from Western Australia to China. He was absolutely disinterested in the idea. Showed no interest at all. Nice guy, but wasn't interested. Uh, I kept working on him during the day, uh, and I said we could put down at Caratha as we fly back from Port Hedland and quickly go and look at the Northwest Shelf project. No, not interested in that. So finally he gave in and we agreed, he agreed we could fly a low figure eight 
over the Northwest Shelf project, which we did probably at an illegally low height. Um, and he was quite amazed at the scale of that project. And I would say that that was, if you like, the first contact, that was the first inkling of natural gas from Australia to China, the start of what has been uh, a new story. It was a modest three million tonne contract. Um, Richard Court led the way as Premier and deserves credit for what was achieved. So in 2001, an export of LNG to China was signed um, and, and got underway. Significantly, that was our first export of LNG to China, but more important, that was China's first import of LNG from anywhere in the world. A bit like the China iron ore story a decade earlier. Uh, today, China is the world's biggest importer of LNG. Extraordinarily rapid economic development. And again, Western Australia in that relationship. So uh, as politics go, you win some and you lose some. After eight years in government, uh, the Liberal Party was defeated by Jeff Gallup and the Labor Party. And uh, that's what I call my gulag years. Uh, you go from being highly relevant to highly irrelevant, but that's part of the political process. Uh, during those years, um, the trade with China um, under the Gallup government continued to grow. I don't think it reached any great heights, but it grew. Uh, and you saw a couple of other developments. Uh, Chinese President Hu Jintao uh, visited Western Australia, the first visit uh, by a Chinese leader, a Chinese president. Uh, that was clearly important and showed that China uh, was getting closer to Australia and particularly to Western Australia and its natural resources. Uh, there was also an, another change that happened, uh, not within government itself. Uh, China was becoming far more expansive around the world in acquiring access to natural resources. Um, in uh, particularly Africa, South America, other parts of the world. Uh, the difference was that most of those countries were less developed or developing countries. Uh, remember, Australia, even then, was a top 20 nation and a highly developed uh, economy. Uh, China came with a, a, an unusual approach. They started buying into resource projects, mining projects on the stock exchange, sometimes very aggressive, volatile uh, takeover bids. Um, they got mixed up with a whole range of various entrepreneurs, shelf companies and the like. Uh, it was starting to untangle a little bit from very much a government to government and big industry approach uh, to something a little bit different. And there's quite a little bit of antagonism in the relationship at that time. Then, as history has it, um, in 2008, um, I'd become leader of the Liberal Party. Um, Alan Carpenter foolishly called a snap election, which he lost. And uh, suddenly I found myself back uh, as Premier, uh, or back into the position of leadership and, and Premier. Uh, I thought during my gulag years, I thought very much about this relationship and I had formed the view very strongly in my mind. When I became Premier, uh, I again in my mind reiterated that this was going to be the third great period of Western Australia's economic development. Um, <clears throat> I felt a personal responsibility that I could not miss that opportunity. Um, indeed, I felt it as a responsibility now, I don't compare myself with John Forrest and the gold rush or Charles Court and the Japanese reconstruction, but I tried to convince myself I'd do everything I can to try and emulate what they did, albeit now around China. Uh, and there's no doubt that this decade that's now just come, coming to an end has been that peak period in the China-Australia relationship and particularly Western Australia. For Western Australia, during this past decade, um, our iron ore exports, uh, our iron ore production overall doubled. Extraordinary growth from what was already a big industry in less than a decade, and principally driven by the growth in demand from China and the expansion of the Chinese uh, steel industry. The LNG industry trebled during the same period to the point where Western Australia, even by itself now, is the world's biggest exporter of LNG, and China is the biggest import, importer. So an extraordinary period, a burst of economic activity that we will not see again from the China relationship, and we may not see again for the next 50 to 100 years, the third great era of economic growth.
And I couldn't believe my luck that I could be, in a sense, part of that. Um, so with that extraordinary output, there were some issues. Um, the first one I've already alluded to, that this China attitude, which I call um, almost their third world or developing economy approach of rushing in and trying to buy out companies uh, and buy mineral resources and deposits uh, was not suitable for the Australia-China relationship. And I took a few risks in, in talking to Chinese leaders. Um, I made the point that Australia is a top 20 nation. It's sophisticated and mature economy. Uh, you should uh, follow the model of Japanese investment of the 1960s and 70s. Japan took small shares in big projects with high quality big companies. Classic example, the Northwest Shelf, the project was built to supply gas to Japan. Japan through Mitsui and Mitsubishi took only one sixth of the equity of that project. Similarly in iron ore, uh, mineral sands, a whole range of different industries. And I urged China to get, to stop getting involved in speculative um, projects. Uh, many of the deposits were not of high quality. They were small. There was no infrastructure. There was no surrounding population or workforce. And mistakes, those mistakes had been made. And I think I played a role in, in changing it. If you look at it now, China's investment is more along the China model. Uh, they have taken small shares in big projects with big global partners. Uh, for example, Chinalco, I think owns about 12% of Rio Tinto. Uh, Bao Steel owns about 5% of FMG. Um, uh, China, uh, Petro China owns 3% of the Gorgon project and so on. And that is a far more stable and a far more successful economic relationship. Um, and you've got to bear in mind that many of the leaders of the state-owned enterprises in China have dual careers. They have a political career and they have a state-owned enterprise career. The political career always comes first. And so many of the leaders have been involved in some of these projects. Uh, they wanted to see a big solid relationship through state-owned enterprises with major Australian companies um, under the auspices of Beijing. Um, that involved, and I regard that as probably a, sort of an unknown uh, result of some of the work I and others, particularly the department did. And we backed that up by trying to build a more mature relationship in other respects due largely to the, the fantastic work of um, the Department of State Development, which reported to me in 2011, uh, Western Australia signed an MOU with the National Development Reform Commission. I think the first such agreement they had reached anywhere in the world with a state or provincial level government. Um, and that set a relationship. We worked together and kept each other fully informed and talked about contentious issues between the West Australian government and the NDRC. The NDRC oversees all major Chinese state-owned enterprise investments, both inside and outside China. We also formed a relationship with SASEC, um, a group that oversees the financial and uh, um, managerial performances of state-owned enterprises. Exchanges of staff, seminars, uh, a very open dialogue. And you might find this impossible to believe, but politicians actually trust each other. They don't lie to each other. They may like to lie to the public, but they don't lie to each other. And that was a very open dialogue at an administrative level and with me as a, a minister uh, and resulted uh, in all sorts of good outcomes. Two things, however, during that sort of period of rapid growth and I think a maturing of the relationship did impact um, at opposite ends of the decade. Uh, when I first became pro, uh, sorry, Premier, um, it was 2008. Uh, it coincided exactly with the global financial crisis down to a single week. Uh, I happened to be in China uh, just shortly after that. And the relationship between Australia and China uh, fell apart to a fair extent. Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister. Uh, the fact that he was fluent in Mandarin very much impressed the Chinese, and Kevin put a, a big effort into the relationship. But all of a sudden, it fell apart. Not so much to do with government, uh, as much to do with private sector arrangements. Uh, and there were a whole host of factors. It was a perfect storm. Uh, these included uh, China getting um, 
feeling it was being not treated fairly under the Foreign Investment Review Board. That was a legacy of some of the, the poor deals being done in the previous few years. Uh, they thought that um, a proposal by BHP and Rio Tinto to merge was designed to monopolise the iron ore industry and therefore hurt China in terms of, of price. Um, Kevin Rudd proposed a mining tax. China interpreted that because it would only apply to coal and iron ore as a tax on China, China being the major customer. Uh, an Australian citizen, uh, Stern Hu, um, had been arrested by the Chinese uh, on allegations of bribery. Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister uh, said he was innocent uh, and criticised the Chinese justice system. At the time I was in Shanghai uh, and that issue was raging. Uh, the Chinese were highly offended by that. Uh, Stern Hu was, uh, lived in Western Australia. I didn't know, know him, but I did uh, undertake that I would try and take up the issue and see where it was at. Uh, it was explained to me by a very senior, well-known uh, Australian living in Shanghai is that the justice system is a bit different. Uh, in Australia, uh, we might arrest someone and then investigate. In China, they will investigate, then arrest. Different system. So you can be pretty sure if someone's arrested in China, they will be guilty. And Stern Hu was guilty. Um, when I tried to raise the issue, um, China didn't want to talk about it. It was sensitive, they took offense at it. Um, and because of the strength of the West Australian-China relationship, they did agree that I could raise it, but only with the mayor of Shanghai, who was the fourth ranking person in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and only in strict privacy. And when I raised it with him, he said, you need to understand, Mr. Barnett, that those issues are basically offending China. Uh, and you also know, and he said, do you want to know what it's really about? And I said, yes, I'd like to know that. And he said, Australia is about to welcome the leader of the Uyghur people. And he said, we regard that group as being terrorists. Now, I'm not adopting that view at all, at all. But that was the view of China. And he said, that is the thing that has offended the government and the Communist Party. So I'm sympathetic to the Uyghur people. I'm sure all of you are too. But that's the way the relationship can sometimes go. So uh, an extraordinary series of events. It got to the point where I was the only person that the Chinese government would speak to. China, I understand Australian minister, federal, was left at the airport. Um, so China takes notice of these things. And I'm not taking sides on the issue. Please don't misunderstand me. But that can be the way the reaction goes. Now, move forward to the end of the, the decade. Um, and we had a second, we're having it now, a second perfect storm uh, and a whole series of issues. Some of them, uh, like the Uyghur people, are genuine serious issues. Uh, obviously, the coronavirus right now is a serious issue. Um, the protests uh, in Hong Kong is a serious issue. Um, China's increasing presence in the southern uh, China, South China Sea is a serious issue. All of those issues need to be handled carefully, strongly, but appropriately through diplomatic and formal channels. What we've seen at the same time with those issues are other issues. China interference on campuses. I've looked around, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Maybe it's there, but I can't see it. Allegations about Chinese um, uh, donations into political campaigns. Well, I think if that's occurring, that's more of an Australian issue, not a Chinese government issue. Uh, issues um, about um, criticising Chinese investment, uh, outspoken comments by backbenchers, federal members of parliament, the use of words, uh, Xi Jinping, a dictator, um, even on the coronavirus, there was always going to be an, uh, some sort of inquiry, but to go out and say this needs to be investigated in an almost accusational way, uh, just as added to this storm. The difference between 2009, around the global financial crisis time, and now, is that in 2009, in that time of tension, China kept quiet, was upset, annoyed, but kept quiet. This time, uh, and the other point is, I guess that was primarily economic issues. This time, it is primarily political issues, 
and China is not keeping quiet. Uh, it has reacted publicly, uh, particularly the Chinese ambassador to Australia. Um, there have been issues about agricultural produce. Now, I know there's other issues around the barley situation. Um, there have been threats about uh, the vulnerable sectors, uh, tourism, international education uh, being affected. Now, I don't know whether they, that will come to pass, but this is different. There is a reaction from China, whereas before it was just an annoyance. This is a more serious situation that we face, and I am extremely concerned about it. Uh, we need to have a respectful uh, relationship with China where there are differences, and there are differences, we need to express them in a professional and proper way through diplomatic and formal channels. Um, so we'll see where it goes. So where are we now? Well, the relationship. China, very quickly in just that sort of 25 year span, now is our number one export market. China takes 36% of Australia's exports. An enormous growth. Uh, in comparison, Japan, 17%. So China, basically double what our next uh, biggest customer is. However, if you just peel away a little bit of that and look at it, of those exports to China, 65% are accounted for by three products, iron ore, coal, and natural gas. And 75% of the exports are accounted for by two states, Western Australia and Queensland. That's it. So here we are, as a successful economy, Australian, a major trading partner, 36%, accounted for essentially by three commodities in two states. That is a vulnerable position for Australia. So we shouldn't be poking the panda. We should be being responsible as a mid-power, responsible nation, but trying to diversify our relationship with, with uh, China. Um, and th there can be a little bit of a view that um, we're immune. China depends on us for natural resources. We don't have to worry. Well, sorry, uh, China has other opportunities for resources. Uh, it likes dealing with Australia. That's been a good history, but it does have other options available. Um, we're not essential to China. And the, this, the group that is strongest is the commodities, uh, minerals, iron ore, coal, natural gas. And it's not just that they are the commodities. They have developed uh, their business with China over this sort of 25, 30 year period. They deal with Chinese state owned enterprises and not the provincial ones, they deal with the Beijing state owned enterprises. These are large, sophisticated global organisations. Um, they have a lot of history in these investments and relationships. So the strength of the commodity trade is as much the commodities as it is their tie to the Chinese state owned enterprises. Get into education or tourism, uh, even agriculture, much, most areas of agriculture. It's dealing with the Chinese private sector. Um, it is dealing with people. It is volatile and at risk. So I think, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of China. I think we need to understand the differences, respect the differences, make our point, make it well and in a proper way on the big issues but we have allowed this to generate into not an economic debate, but a political debate. And I think if you follow the history of China and its government, uh, China could react. If Australia insults China, it insults the Chinese people. And that's what we need to be aware of. So my simple advice for what it would be, I would just urge uh, federal members of parliament in particular, uh, different sectors of industry and government, uh, just don't back off, don't compromise but tone it down, just tone it down and be more responsible. Um, over my time with China, um, I think I've been able to deal with some, some big issues. It's been an extraordinary experience as a, a graduate of this university and a, a local or state politician. Uh, there's been a lot of extraordinary personal experiences along the way. And I guess uh, some of my few quaint memories to finish off, I'll finish with this. Um, I remember, one of my earliest visits to China, I always stayed in the Peace Hotel in Shanghai, which itself is full of Chinese history. Uh, and this is in the early 90s. I decided I'd wander down the Nanjing Road uh, on a Sunday morning. And I suddenly, in this 
throng of humanity suddenly realized there was the only Westerner there. And uh, as I walked along, I saw a little old man with a ponytail sitting on the curb with a baby boy, perhaps two or three years old, looking at me uh, as I approached. And this little boy looked at me and just burst out laughing. He had never probably seen a Western. He thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. The old man was embarrassed and shy and this crowd sort of gathered around and it was just a, a beautiful moment of the only time in my life feeling truly foreign, can I say also feeling truly safe and uh, respected and liked by the people in the street. Uh, in another situation, I went dancing with uh, Gina Reinhardt on the uh, nightclub at the Baths of the Peace Hotel. Uh, someone dared us to have a dance and we did. Um, this was full of young Chinese couples uh, dancing. As soon as Gina and I walked out onto the dance floor, we were both very embarrassed, they all left the dance floor, stood in a barrier around the edge and applauded. And I said to Gina, how are we going to get out of this? <laughs> we sort of sulked off into the thing. So lots of lovely little memories, um, lots of good things. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the peak of the period probably coincided when I had dinner with Xi Jinping, along with Tony Abbott and three or four other state premiers. Um, he called me shark killer. Um, that was the time when we had all the shark deaths along West Australia's coastline. So news gets around, so I was called shark killer all night. But that personal relationship um, between politicians who do trust each other, who do speak out openly and discuss issues, uh, is there. And industry has been the prime developer of the economic relationship. Countries like China, which still have many developing parts, place huge emphasis on their relationships with governments. And I must say, I think the China-Australia relationship has been predominantly a China-Western Australian relationship on economic matters. And I always tried to keep to economic matters, uh, not delve into foreign policy or the like. Um, that is a good thing. And um, this will be the final comment. The dinner with Xi Jinping, which was very sort of social and cordial um, as it went on. At the time, Tony Abbott had taken a big trade mission of Australia's business leaders to Beijing. The private dinner in the Great Hall with Xi Jinping, the only people there were federal and state premiers, prime ministers. Not a single business leader was invited. So we need to just reassess, and I'd urge Australian business people to learn a bit more about the way in which China actually operates. But thanks for listening to me, and I hope that gives you a view, my view, and as I say, I am not a China expert. There are more uh, people in that, that area. But I have had this, I think, interesting experience of seeing China develop and Western Australia be part of it. And I do worry about the mess we've got ourselves into now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll hand back to Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Colin, for a fascinating. Um discussion, that's fine, yeah. Um, yeah, some fascinating insights on your own personal experience dealing with China. Um, I feel like we could sit and listen to you for hours. So in the interest of time, I think we'll just open for any questions um, from the floor. So uh, we're just using the one computer here. So if you could just interject um, vocally rather than uh, raising your hand, thanks. Over to you, Colin. Okay, thanks, Michael. It's a weird experience talking into a, an empty lecture theatre. So I do sympathise with both um, academic staff and students, but. Hopefully we'll get through this pretty quickly. Any oh, comments? Anna, it's Alison here. Um, I was always curious to see how you were going to do this seminar because I know how much you love technology. So yeah. I, I see how it's uh, working. Um, Colin, obviously the, the, the big question that's, that, that has to be asked given what's happened in the last few days is you, you've, you've said nothing right now about China and uh, in Hong Kong, um, you know, and I was just looking there to see what Chris Patton's been saying about it because obviously he's been quite vocal. And one comment that he's got there is, we keep kidding, uh, we keep on kidding ourselves that unless we do everything that China wants, we will somehow miss out on some great trading opportunities. This is drivel. You know, I mean, I'm frightened by what China's doing. Um, and the commentary that I keep hearing is now that they've done what they've done to Hong Kong, you know, t Taiwan might be next. So. Can you just talk to that? I know that you said you don't want to mix trade and, and politics, but we can't not. They do go together. Thanks. Well, yeah, Alison. Uh, well, they, they do come together. I, I think as a you know, state premier, uh, I took a view it wasn't my place to lead state government into some of those issues. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't 
dismiss them in any sense. But you know, Chris Patton might have his view and he's got the history of you know, being an administrator or whatever he was in, in Hong Kong. But I think what we're seeing from Australia are too many people, too many commentators, politicians, journalists, many of whom probably have not never been to China, um, being quite aggressive and using those terms like dictators and investigator and the like. Uh, I don't think that's the sign of a mature first world nation. Uh, and I think, you know, gratuitous advice to Scott Morris, and he needs to keep the commentary to himself and the foreign minister. He needs to shut down a lot. You know, journos will do their thing, that's fine. But our government needs to uh, just step back and take a responsible, a strong position, but a properly conducted one. China understands, China, for example, understands um, with the Trump era that the ANZUS Treaty between Australia and New Zealand and the US is at the centre of our defence and foreign policy. They understand that, they, they get that. Um, so they sort of, I think, want to see us you know, show a little bit of independence, but be careful and responsible. And uh, I do genuinely think, Alison, um, I didn't think this until a few weeks ago, but I do genuinely think now our trade is at risk. And you know the threats about higher education, the threats about tourism and so on, uh, it is very easy for a country like China just to simply redirect the traffic away from Australia. And they do have options. Lots of very fine universities around the world. Uh, even people saying, um, you know, iron ore, they depend on our iron ore you know, for their steel industry. Well, yes, they do. But China's just acquired the rights to the Sinadu deposits in Guinea, in Guinea and Africa. They are by far the best iron ore deposits in the world in terms of grade, lack of impurities, um, volume of iron ore. So even that industry, our number one industry, is to some extent vulnerable. It's probably only the relationship historically and with the state-owned enterprises that makes them fairly safe. Now, I'm surprised China's reacting this, you know, using the sort of language it is. Okay. Anyone else out there in the room? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Colin, for sharing with us about your experience, observations, and uh, insights about China. Now, uh, I'm really interested in the, uh, uh, the comments you mentioned, the comparing uh, uh, China and Japan. The, the, you mentioned that the state played a key role to strengthen the link between Japanese and uh, Australian economy, particularly Western Australian economy, the state played played a very critical role. And uh, over the last decades, uh, your government and uh, the government probably did the same with uh, uh, exception links between uh, China and uh, Australia, Western Australia. But my question is, I definitely I think uh, Australian national interest, in particular economic interest, kind of. Has, strong link with Asian countries. But uh, uh, I'm not sure whether the federal politicians, politicians in Canberra and the politicians say in uh, Melbourne or, or Perth, share the same, uh, 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 how to say, uh, perspective. The uh, economic link is, is very strong, but uh, I can say, uh, uh, politicians in Canberra, they don't go to Asia for holidays, they go to holidays in London, uh, <laughs> New York, or, or Hawaii. And after retirement, they take their jobs over there too. So my original question is, how much, how much role do state leaders uh, can play in this, say, uh, uh, strengthening the relations with the foreign, foreign government, particularly yeah. in this case in China? Well, I, um, Canberra politicians won't like what you've said and what I'll probably say. No, um, but I think, I think there is a lot of truth in that. And I think Canberra is slow to recognise that the relationship particularly with Japan and, and more particularly now with China has been primarily by industry in the resources and agricultural sector and state governments. And the reason state governments are there uh, primarily is simply ownership. The minerals uh, and much of the gas and the agricultural land is all state owned. The water resources are state owned. Um, so it's a direct involvement. Um, the Japan relationship was very much driven by politicians from Western Australia. So federal government's got its role 
but it, at one stage, uh, Chinese Chinese ministers actually said to me, uh, "We think we we get um, that the West Australian state governments are more effective than the federal government." They actually made that point to me. I mean, it's part of that honesty amongst politicians or honesty amongst thieves, if you like. But um, so it is true, and um, uh, it gets brought up in, in other whole range of issues. Uh, and I think also some of the commentary, which I think is more self-promotion by some individuals um, is damaging. Uh, West Australia, Queens, Queensland really pioneered the tourism industry um, more than anyone else. Uh, so I think it's a reality and it's, um, and the point I made toward the end was, you know, we've got to be a bit careful here. You know, everyone, I, I just get amused when I hear all the commentators and politicians continually say China is our major trading partner. Well, yes, it is 36% of exports, but as I said, it's three commodities and two states. This is not the sort of trading relationship that will sustain Australia as a whole. And uh, you know, I think that's not understood. So, and I think a lot of the federal trips, you know, when people go there, they go there on trade missions and they get you know, treated very nicely and so on. They don't tend to get down to the uh, hard level of negotiation. I think of our prime ministers, not being political, I think Tony Abbott probably best understood China and had the best personal relationship with China. Uh, ironically, uh, just one more quick comment. Uh, you mentioned the rightly, Kevin Rudd is the one who speaks in Mandarin, is supposed to understand China, but the relationship deteriorated since uh, his, he was in government in Canberra. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, everyone's had their sort of successes and failures in China. I think Western Australia, and I do praise us, the government departments here, I think they work very well at a, at a sort of a working level. Um, on individual projects and sorting out problems. And, uh, you know, at the, at the peak of that mining boom, if you like, around 2012, um, the, the West Australia's exports to China were 70% of Australia's exports to China, 70%. And Chinese investment in Australia at that time was 80% into Western Australia. And the really bizarre statistic that probably none of you will um, agree with, but it's true, at the peak of that period of uh, high mining activity and high prices, Western Australia's exports to China, just Western Australia, was equal to half of all of the USA exports to China. I mean, we're a big player in Chinese mines and the Chinese, I think, preferred to deal, particularly with Western Australia and Queensland on coal and, and some of the service areas, um, because we did have a huge role and we had a good relationship. And again, I go back, you know, the Chan'an mine, um, first export of LNG, things that China took great pride in. And, um, you know, you can sort of play that card for a while, but uh, we need to work hard in this state to um, just try and maintain a good relationship. And you can discuss, you know, the sensitive, the hard issues, um, but you tend, you don't probably do it so much publicly. Chinese people will discuss those issues, that's been my experience, but they'll do it in a very discreet way. And I think we just need to you know, understand a different system of government um, and Chinese people, I think, um, I don't know anyone listening, but uh, now China, Chinese people, from observation, are very proud of what their country's achieved. Um, they're, they're more prosperous um, and the like. Their, their living standards are a lot better generally, uh, and they have genuine pride. So I don't think we're very smart if we uh, continually sort of come out in a, an aggressive manner. Thank you, Rod. Okay. <laughs> Yes, um, I wonder if I could, I mean, just coming back to the hard issues to, um, to make a quick comment on Alison's concern earlier. I mean, um, with respect to Hong Kong, uh, I think we have to recognise, and, and I don't understand why Patton doesn't really, but um, that the, the, the security law, uh, which was designed to prevent anything that would offend mainland China emerging out of Hong Kong, uh, was signed off on as part of the cessation agreement at the time when the UK separated from Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, but it was never enacted by the Hong Kong legislature. And so the, in, a, in a sense, from a legal standpoint, the Chinese government has some rights in this regard to ensure that that part of the separation agreement was in fact, in the end, implemented. Um, and it is, um, and while I personally sympathise considerably with the protest movement in Hong Kong, and, and I actually love Hong Kong as a place, um, 
the inevitability of it becoming part of China um, is seems to me not to be properly realized by many of the young people there, although many of those who we see protest most loudly and most violently already have uh, visas in foreign countries and can get out when they need to. Um, in a recent conversation with um, uh, some folks in China, um, uh, I was surprised to learn that uh, uh, at the time of the Tiananmen Square uh, conflict, most of the students who were in the square, um, almost all it's claimed, uh, or had visas abroad. In, in other words, were able to escape abroad um, following the end of the conflict. But many of those who had been drawn into it um, then suffered subsequently. And there's an issue, I think, in the case of, uh, of Hong Kong, where the inevitability seems to be not realized. Um, but that's just a comment. If I could come back to the question of, of, um, uh, of, of Australia. First of all, I was surprised to hear the, uh, the, the size of, of the, um, our dependence on the Chinese market for natural gas. I thought we were selling a lot to Korea and Japan and other places as well. And I'd, I'd be curious. Um, uh, as to comment as to the potential for diversification in our trade um, out, uh, away from China to other, other possible destinations, particularly with respect to natural gas. And finally, um, the elephant in the room here, um, it seems to me, in terms of a lot of this tension, is the United States. And um, the United States, notwithstanding what Collins mentioned about foreign investment in Western Australia and so on, um, the United States supposedly is by far and away the largest owner of, uh, of capital in Australia. And I'm, I'd be curious if, if Colin has in his head the numbers um, in terms of investment in Western Australian mining, is the US a big player on the capital owning front or is it less than China in the case of Western Australia? Well, just on, thank you. Just on that, um, the US is by far the biggest investor and particularly in LNG. Um, I'm pleased now that China is, is taking small shares in, in those projects. I think that builds a, a good relationship between a, a big producer and, a, and now a very big customer. Um, the diversification point, uh, yes, that's logical. Um, and uh, as I think I said, um, China can sustain Western Australia and Queensland. It can't sustain the whole country. Uh, but even there, during my time as Premier, there was quite a bit of work done on diversification. Um, but in my view, again, it has to be where you have a natural advantage, and certainly a comparative, but preferably even natural or absolute advantage. Uh, and I think it's significant, and again, China's quite proud of it. The Ord River Scheme, one of the, the iconic project uh, started you know, way back in the, in the 1960s or early 70s. Uh, who would have thought today that a private company out of Shanghai would be the major land developer on the Ord River project. And I spoke to Xi Jinping about that. He wasn't aware of it, but he understood the significance and the symbolism of that. Um, but all those sectors are going to be less secure than the big resources and the estate agreements. because They're dealing with maybe smaller state-owned enterprises, uh, provincial ones, and predominantly now with the growing private sector. I think finally, on, on your first comment, um, the issues like Hong Kong, and, and I probably would share your views on that, uh, but if Australia simply says uh, this is wrong um, and the relationship declines, our ability to help support um, that liberalisation of the Chinese political system will just be diminished. And I think we do need to recognise, you mentioned Tiananmen Square um, and all the other issues. And China's got a turbulent history. Um, it's a diverse economy. I mean, I think there couldn't be a harder country in the world to govern, I imagine than China itself. Um, and I think we should recognise that the economic liberalisation that's occurring um, is perhaps slowly, but you would expect that to be followed by some political liberalisation. But I don't think it is our position to lecture China. I think it's our position to make our opinions known and to try and be courteous and constructive on those issues. Um, and I, that, that's the, the view I, I simply hold. Um, and I, I, get, I worry when we don't, when we behave like a, a strange little country instead of as a responsible top 20 nation. Yeah, uh, can I come back though briefly on the, on the question of natural gas? So, um, oh. What do you see as the prospects for diversifying export destinations on natural gas? Well, 
We do. I mean, our first gas exports were 100% to Japan. Um, then um, Kogas, the Koreans, started buying gas. Um, and just as an aside, I can remember going and speaking uh, that in Korea at a conference about gas, and there was a lot of controversy, and uh, it was all very polite. And then the, the minister and the head of Kogas um, took me to one side and said, we've got three questions for you. Uh, have you got the gas? Uh, will you sell it to Korea? Uh, and what will the price be? And, uh, and they said, and by the way, we're sick of all these presentations about gas. We just want answers to those three questions. And that's an example, I think, of what I'd call the honesty amongst politicians. They get to the point, they say what they think. Um, look, uh, our gas reserves, uh, you know, we're the world's biggest exporter, but there's plenty of gas around the world, um, particularly all the Gulf states. Uh, yeah. But you, 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 I, th I think our gas sales are quite diversified. Japan, Korea, uh, China are three big markets, and, and Europe might emerge as, as an export market too. But I think in other areas, on the diversification uh, point, I think there are a lot of opportunities to diversify in areas of natural advantage. Um, in Western Australia, we could do a lot more in agriculture, um, all, sorts of, all sorts of things, and we're not doing it um, as well as we can. We keep telling ourselves we're the world's best farmers. Well, there's gonna be a lot of competition from the Black Sea nations coming and uh, other parts of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, our universities, I mean, you know, close to everyone taking part, very vulnerable, and we're seeing that now. Um, very easy for China simply to say, well, well, students, we think you should go to, a, you know, European or American universities. And even just that mention will cause a big swing in enrolments. So, um, but, yeah, we do need to diversify the relationship, and that's why um, the link with the National Development Reform Commission, the Ord River Project is an example. Um, and now some investments in broader areas of agriculture, but it's still a bit clumsy. Um, Chinese in agriculture are running around buying land, and my comment to them has been, you don't need to do that. You need to contract to get the quality product. Yeah. Um, but they, I think they had some bad deals in South America where they went in and uh, entered into contracting arrangements around oil, and the Brazilian government, I think, just took it off them. So there's that sovereign risk thing in their mind. Thank you. So, Colin, if I may ask one. So you have talked about uh, how we should be more responsible and careful in, in how we comment um, about issues that, are on that pertain to China. And, and to some extent, you're arguing that that comes from understanding the political and social culture. But what about expecting them to understand the culture that we have, where you know, in a democracy, we will have multiple point of views. Some of them will be, you know, supportive of China. Some of them will not be, and not to be offended by, you know, what one politician says. Well, I think in China, and again, I'm no political expert in, in a sense, but um, you know, it, it is a one-party um, communist party government that most Chinese people sort of go along with. Uh, they would probably interpret uh, comments by an individual member of parliament as somehow representing the government. Uh, they would see it in a different light than, than we do. Um, so I, I think it's, and it looks from a political, local political point of view, it looks disorganised from a government to be doing that. So I, I just think we just need to have that formality in our public comments and try and build the informality of being able to sit down face to face and be absolutely honest and, and frank with each other. Um, uh, we. We, we will be the losers if this continues. I mean, I think it will probably quieten down, but if it doesn't, Australia will be big losers. Thanks. How are we going? <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, maybe I'll just yep. uh, follow up. Yep. <laughs> follow up with my uh, with question on, uh, on the understanding uh, uh, Chinese understanding of uh, uh, Australian society and culture. I think in my 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 own personal opinion, I think uh, the I think of ordinary citizens in both countries, uh, Chinese probably know much more about the Australians than Australians know about China. So this uh, uh, information asymmetry in in base. That's my first point. And the second point about the. Uh, uh, the, you mentioned the uh, political liberalization. I think what the uh, Australian and American government is doing is really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's on the opposite side. It's not helping. It, on, 
it basically what they are doing at the moment is rallying the entire nation behind the, the Chinese leader. Very strong. Yeah, well, I think if, if Australia or Australians uh, would want to see change in China, uh, we're going to be more effective if we've got a close and a working relationship with China than if we're at odds. And I think going back in terms of some of the economic history too, uh, Australia is not faultless and, and that's not surprising. I mean, um, while I think the agreement with the National Development Reform Commission I referred to is important in a good working relationship, I don't agree with Victoria signing up to the Belt and Road Initiative. To me, uh, that enters into a, a, a foreign affairs type arrangement and I don't think that is the role of the state government and I actually don't think that's in Australia's interest. But Australia um, could be criticised from another point of view. Um, people have complained about some Chinese investment uh, and I think some of it's probably not in our interest. But it was the Northern Territory sanctioned by the federal government to sell Darwin Port to a Chinese enterprise. Now, Darwin's an important defence facility for us and now the Americans. So, you know, I don't think that was thought through. Uh, and I think there's, there's other examples like that. Um, so, you know, and, and I think you know, going back to the, um, particularly the early part of um, this decade, uh, the Chinese were very upset about the Foreign Investment Review Board. And I had a number of discussions with their leadership and others uh, about that. And I've got to say at that time, the, the criteria and the way in which it was applied was confusing. And it wasn't really an anger, it was a confusion. Like, I can remember Chinese state-owned enterprises saying, well, what, what is allowed and what isn't? We just want to know what the rules are, simple as that. And the rules were not obvious, not obvious to me and certainly not to, to Chinese and other countries. So um, we, we, you know, we can be a little bit too pure, I think, in uh, the way we talk about ourselves sometimes. Do I have a quick question? Do yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Indeed. I've got an empty lecture no. theatre. So. <laughs> Do Chinese people know indeed more about Australia than Australians know about China? Would you agree with that? And does that also apply to you and politicians in general? No, I don't. I don't think they do. I I think um, obviously the students who come here or um, would know a fair bit about Australia, but uh, uh, I think Australians uh, need to know more about. Ch I think we probably know more about China than. Chinese know about Australia, but well, again, I, I think it's, in, it's in, in, you don't think so, yeah, okay. Um, but I, I would like to see more Australians know, you know more about all parts of the world. And, uh, and I think everyone would agree with young people with us to part of their study or get to, to travel in different parts of the world at a young age is a really helpful thing. Uh, I mean, I, I've found in, in my you know, trips to China over the years, I've been uh, incredibly welcomed, um, people polite from all sorts of walks of life, but uh, there is always one thing that happens, one usually a trivial thing that reminds me um, I'm in a single party communist country. Uh, some little, you know, and there are, there are big fundamental differences. Uh, they will no doubt change over time, but it'll be a slow process. Thank you. This uh, single communist party, I think it's a misconception, it's really communist party, that's really by name. Are they really communists? Well, I don't know. They're very <laughs> entrepreneurial these days. <laughs> uh, look, I, I ask, um, a, a, and I won't uh, name the person, but a, a leading um, television personality in China who I um, met her and uh, her partner, and we're just having a drink and enjoying. And I asked exactly that question about, you know, how do the Chinese people think about having one party communist party? Now, you may not agree, but her response to me was, um, the Chinese people are proud of the success of their country. Um, they're enjoying prosperity, better quality of life, education, health, diet, all those things. Um, and she said the Chinese people broadly support the party, uh, but she said if the party ever gets to the point of not selecting the best people in key roles, it will change. Now, that was her, and she said, and, and she was a support, supporter of Xi Jinping, uh, she said, people see that the leadership is, is highly intelligent, competent people. But if it got away to nepotism and the like, or corruption, um, it would change, attitudes would change. So she said, as long as they are seen to have good people and governing well, in quotes, um, Chinese people are broadly happy. So that was just one, and she was a major public affairs commentator. I don't know if she got to say that on television, but she said it to me. <laughs> 
I was, uh, as a little aside, uh, when all the, um, this, uh, this is a little anecdote, um, when the issue was going on uh, during Kevin Rudd's time and we had all this tension uh, about Zhu uh, in Shanghai in particular, uh, and there was an elderly Chinese uh, TV commentator who ran a sort of a current affairs program, which apparently all the leadership um, listened to, watched. And uh, he contacted me and said, I'd like to interview you about this sort of crisis in China-Australia relations. And uh, he set up a little studio in the hotel I was staying at. And when I walked in there, and um, he said, I I've interviewed 300 world leaders in my life. And I said, well, I'm hardly a world leader. And he said, no, you're not, but you are this week. And you know, that was the way it was being dealt with. Okay, we're all done. Uh, can I yep. uh, just one very quick thing. Uh, uh, when you mentioned the issue over the Foreign uh, um, Investment Review Board, mm. um, at the time that you were discussing, um, I think there was a, a point of confusion. I mean, the idea that state-owned enterprises were 100% uh, instruments of the government um, was uh, uh, very strong in Australia. And, uh, uh, and so there was this reluctance to take state-owned enterprise investment, at least on a large scale. Um, while at the same time in Australia, um, you know, aside from the three commodities you mentioned, our largest export to China is entirely from state-owned enterprises, namely us. Mm. Um, and I don't think that point of distinction was quite recognised. Moreover, uh, when we think of uh, Huawei and Tencent and so forth, these are not state-owned enterprises. These are supposedly private enterprises. And, and, and the distinction is rather like it used to be, as you, as you implied earlier, uh, it used to be with Japan. Right? Um, Japan has these large, very private organisations, but you know, the, the distinction between them and the state is far more blurry than it is between private enterprises in Australia or the United States and the state. Uh, and I suspect there was some confusion on the Australian side of that, in that period. Yeah, there certainly was. And, um, and I think, you know, you mentioned you know, Japan, that early relationship around iron ore and coal and then natural gas was very strongly driven by the Japanese government. Um, and they weren't, in a, in a sense, front and centre, but you had um, the Japanese trading houses like Mitsui and Mitsubishi uh, doing it, the, the steel companies and the energy companies, um, notionally private, but very much under Japanese government control through that era. Uh, and and it's so, so is the case. I think the, the, the state-owned enterprises, I think, are very sophisticated Chinese businesses. They are government-owned, they have to report financially and so on, but they are under a political directive. Um, they're not entirely, and, and that, I guess when I went from being a minister going to China and then being a premier going to China, um, I, I sort of got elevated. Uh, from previous visits, I'd meet chairmen of state-owned enterprises or managing directors. But when I went back as premier, suddenly I was meeting the party secretary. And uh, I remember I visited um, Bao Steel in Shanghai, who's probably the most prestigious state-owned enterprise. And when I went there, they said, oh, Mr. Barnett, you've, you know, visited and met with Bao Stuhl many times, we'd now like to introduce the party secretary to you. And I thought, oh, it's a bit interesting, not a student of the political system. And I thought, this will be some old bloke out of the long march or whatever. Not mm -hmm. true. Out he came, probably early 40s, beautiful Italian suit, uh, European educated, perfect English. Uh, and I realized on that moment, the guy who really oversaw Bao Stuhl was the party. And the same uh, when I went to some of the provinces, um, previously I'd be hosted by the governor, uh, suddenly I was being hosted by the party secretary of the province. And so, you know, it's an interesting system, very different than ours. I don't, and I don't pretend to understand it fully, but I don't think Australian business understands that well either. Yeah. And a number of times I'd be asked by people in those sorts of positions about Australia and about Australian policies, government, uh, and about Australia's major businesses, even sometimes about individuals. So that's that openness, but very clearly a political figure in a state-owned enterprise and probably then moving on to be a provincial governor and maybe a minister, who knows him. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can, All right. can I ask a quick, sorry, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, and in and, and my research, I'm interested in personal relations. So I, I'd like that part of your talk, especially. I'm lousy um, on personal relations. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but do you have any examples where um, like strong personal relationships between government officials uh, in Australia and China or, or maybe broader helped with those uh, political liberal liberalization? Uh, look, not in, in a strictly personal, in, in a sense, friendship uh, yeah. system, no. Um, but uh, it, it is the honesty and the openness. Uh, for, for example, uh, I, I mentioned I met, I think I mentioned I met a, a senior state council minister about the LNG business when it was being developed. And uh, he, um, he was heading back to Beijing, so I had to meet him at the rail station and the train waited while we met and I thought that wouldn't happen in Australia. But he, he said to me, uh, well, what would you do about, if you, were, if you were in my position, what would you do about buying LNG? Would you buy it from Australia or would you buy it from the Middle East? And I said, I'd buy it from both. And he said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And that's what they did. So that, that's, I guess, a sort of a personal confidence and trust um, that is there. But uh, beyond that, not into sort of social engagements. I mean, I didn't like cocktail parties all that much. So. But, uh, but I think that directness um, is important. And, um, you know, there was, there was one time when uh, Kevin, I wasn't there, but Kevin Rudd, with his fluent Mandarin, um, criticised um, uh, an Australian company um, at one stage. Um, and he did it uh, in Mandarin, not realising, this is in China, that some of the Australians or the English Westerners there actually spoke fluent Mandarin, got straight back to the Chinese. And, you know, that, so they didn't, they didn't like that. And, I, and I've noticed even more recently, the formal meeting will be through interpreters um, and not entirely scripted, but through a formal interpreter. Then, and sometimes I would think, well, I don't certainly, I certainly don't speak any Mandarin and perhaps these people don't speak uh, English. But invariably when the meeting finished, the formal part, then uh, you start me a cup of coffee, they would immediately break into English, perfect English, and chat and be quite humorous. So, I don't know, a bit of a dual relationship then. Yeah. But I think, in, in part of that, the one thing that I, I think I'm right in this, that so many of the leaders, uh, whether they are provincial governors or uh, senior people in state-owned enterprises or party secretaries, they do have, tend to have this dual career of a political career and probably a sort of a, a administration or state-owned enterprise career. And they run in parallel, they'll change roles, but that political career always comes first. And I don't think we appreciate that quite enough. So um, pretty dangerous to be talking to a state-owned enterprise and criticise the Chinese government. That will get back straight to a Chinese minister. Not good for business. Yep. Okay. Right. I think we're done. Thanks very much. For, <laughs> and uh, again, thanks for having me as part of your business school. Cheers. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Colin. Yeah, fascinating discussion. Um, a slightly different flavour to our usual seminars, but. Um, I know I speak on behalf of all the participants in saying that I really enjoyed it. So thanks once again for your time today. Thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you back in. Thanks, Colin. Soon. Yep, thanks, Michael. Take care. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.